Check, check, check. <clears throat> All right, we good to go? Yeah, good. Good. All right. I'm good. First, I want to say praise the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone who was here, spiritual and physical Israel as well as those who are watching live on the internet, Facebook, YouTube, or wherever you may be. Peace to you as well. My name is uh, Brother Travis. I'm from the Las Vegas class. Las Vegas sends uh, greetings. Uh, you know, Las Vegas, we got much love from, for our L.A. brothers and sisters, so it's, uh, it's always a pleasure, absolute pleasure, to uh, come and fellowship with you all. And I'd like to always say thank you to Brian for extending the invitation. Huh. So, without getting that out of the way, uh, trying to get over my nervous, my being nervous and jumpy as a rabbit's nose, <laughs> we don't know that, we're going to suffer through this. And please forgive me, I, I'm, I'm suffering through a cold. I was down pretty hard this week, but with the Lord, you know, being behind me, I, you know, I, hopefully I can push through this thing without yes, annoying you guys too much. Anyway, so uh, Brother Brian, we're gonna, before we do this thing, we got a little exercise I want everybody to participate in. Brother Brian is going to pass out the exercise. Please don't turn it, over, turn it over so that you can't read it until everybody has a copy in their hand. Do not look at it. Don't look at it until everybody has a copy in their hand. So hopefully also everybody has a writing utensil because uh, you may need that. Please do not look at the exercise until everybody has a copy. Typical Israel. <laughs> yep, yeah, good, thank you. Everybody covered? We all good? Does everybody got it? Okay, go ahead and turn it over and complete the exercise. Right, get to it, y'all. Come on, y'all playing. No, it is really not. Mm hmm. <laughs> Israel don't want to be happy. <laughs> Poor Israel. Don't want to follow instructions, don't want to be happy. There we go. Finally, somebody stood up, stretched their legs. At least we know somebody's <coughs> reading. Right. We know somebody's reading. Somebody's shaking hands. Mm -hmm. yeah. One Israelite, Israel boy, tough crowd boy. <laughs> you see nobody else stand up, did you? Not very many, no. <laughs> <laughs> How we doing? Is everybody, has everybody uh, completed or we still need a little time? Raise your hand if you completed the task. Y'all didn't stand up. 
<laughs> yeah, stand up, stretch your legs, and sit back down. The very first thing, though, it says read all the instructions. All right, fine. <laughs> I stood up. <laughs> all right. So if we, everybody's completed, right? Okay. All right, so how well did you guys do? Excellent. Some of you did good, some maybe y'all, oh, not, so not so good. <laughs> See, right. this, is, this is a classic example of what happens to our people. This is a classic example of what happens to Israel. We have, a, we have a hard time reading and following all instructions. Let me, let me have that. Let me have it, if you don't mind, brother. Read and follow all instructions carefully <laughs> and keep your pen in your hand at all times. You know, if you don't, when you're dealing with the Word of God, you have to be careful. You need to be very careful and very mindful of what you're, what you're doing when you're dealing with the Word of God. Now, this lesson is, is titled Holy Things. God's holy things are very, he's very serious about his holy things. He is very serious about his holy things. So serious, it can mean your life or your death. It can also mean your salvation. That's how important his holy things are to him. So it would behoove you to read the instructions, all the instructions, very carefully, would it not? Yes, sir. So this lesson, is going, what we're going to try to focus on is to show you how important following God's instructions are. We're going to try to show that God is serious about his holy things with a particular focus on showbread, okay? Showbread being one of God's holy things, we're going to, we're going to kind of focus on that because I can't cover everything. I'll have you guys in here two or three days, but I'll, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to kind of short it up. We're going to focus on the showbread, and the other thing is to show the implications of the mishandling of God's holy things, I'm going to show you the implications of it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the lesson. Holy things. John 5 and 39. We're going to pick this thing up in John 5 and 39. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Search the scriptures. Mm -hmm. For in them... You think you have eternal life. That's right. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. You got to search these scriptures. You, you need to be in this book on a regular basis, searching through these scriptures to find out what it is that God will have you to do. He doesn't, he don't have us, you know, out here doing stuff just to get some exercise. He wants you to know what you're doing. He wants you to be able to explain what you're doing. He wants you to be able to live what you're doing, what he says for you to live and do. Okay. Search these scriptures. For in them... You, you think you have eternal life. Go ahead. And they are they mm -hmm. which testify of me. They testify of Jesus. You want to know how to serve Jesus? You want to know who Jesus is? You got to look through. You got to search these scriptures, right? You got to yes, search these scriptures. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. We're going to pick it up at verse 15. Second Timothy 2, and we're going to pick it up at verse 15. When you get it, brother, go ahead. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Show thee, study to show thyself approved unto man. Unto God. Unto man. Unto God. Unto God. Show thee, study to show yourself approved unto God. That's, that's why you're doing these things. That's why you're in here on the Sabbath day standing up to read. To hear what thus saith the Lord, to show yourself approved unto him. Because that's, that's, the, only one, that's the, only thing, the only person you've got to prove yourself to, right? Mm -hmm. He's the only one that matters. Study to show yourself approved unto him, because there is a greater reward for your study. We're trying to get something out of this, right? We, we all know there's got to be something better than this life we're going through, so we've got to study to get that. Because mm. it ain't going to be handed to you, Right? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Go ahead. A workman uh -huh. that needeth not be ashamed. You need not to be ashamed of your study. And you need not be ashamed of yourself for the actions that, that come from the study. The fruits of that labor, right? Keep going. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's, that's the, important, the, the important, important part. I can't even talk. The important part. 
rightly dividing these scriptures. Rightly dividing these scriptures. Because rightly dividing these scriptures may save your life. It may save your life. It also may save your salvation. Hmm. Which is even more important than this, than this, this fleshly life. Let's go to, uh, or no, 16. keep going, keep going. 16. Mm -hmm. But shun profane and vain babblings, uh -huh. for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Okay, Shame profa shun profane and vain babblings, them useless words. Israel, we got a lot, we got a big problem with profane and vain babblings. We have a, a big problem with that. that. You know, you can't, I can't stand on the corner using all kinds of whatever kind of language I want and represent the Lord. That don't make no kind of sense. That's right. That don't make no kind of sense. If Brother Font here, you know, he's, he wants to get a business, his own business cracking, right? If he hires me to do, you know, certain, certain work for him, I can't go out in Font's name and be cussing out his customers. He fired me, right? Because I represent Font. So I got to put on my best font face for, for his customers. Why is it, okay, in my job, you know, I won't go out and when I, I meet customers on a daily basis and I won't, you know, I, rep, I know that I represent my boss, so I, I talk professionally to them. Why is it that Israel has more respect for their boss mm. than they do for God? Come on now. Come on now. You, don't, you don't go and, and, and pick up this, this book and tell people you represent God, and then you let that filth fly out of your mouth. That makes no sense, Israel. We got to do better. We got to do better. Because I hear, I hear too many brothers and sisters in the truth taking liberties with God's word. And that offends me, because this is, this is, God, this is God's holy thing right here. This is, this is the, your way to eternal life, right here in your hands. You should not mistreat this thing. Did we finish that? Yes, we did. Okay, let's keep moving. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. Come on. And that from a child, mm -hmm. thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. And from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. We taught all of us pretty much, no matter what, what religion or walk of life you came from, if you had any uh, church schooling at all, you was taught from a young age to keep the Ten Commandments, right? Yes, sir. We all heard to keep the, to keep the commandments. We all heard that from, from a child up. Train up a child in the way he should go, right? Yes, sir. Keep going. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, mm -hmm. which is in Christ Jesus. That's right, because this, these commandments, if you keep them, they will make you wise in a, to, to, to gain your salvation, right? And it only comes through, through Christ Jesus. When we got older, from studying this book, studying to show ourselves approved, we realized, wait a minute. The fourth commandment says, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy, right? Yes, sir. But we're in here on Sunday. Something don't, matter. Something, something, something don't line up. Mm -hmm. So we got in this book and we studied a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, thankfully, all of us in here, we can, you can really say you hit the lottery. Huh. You can thank God for that he opened your eyes and you have understanding enough to know that you should be in here studying this word today instead of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you, you got enough knowledge to know to stay away from all that pagan crap that we just went past mm. and be in here today keeping, yourself, keeping your hands from sin. You hit the lotto. Whether you know it or not, you are rich. Hmm. That is a blessing. That is a true blessing. So, train up a child when he is, you know, train up a child in the way he should go when he is young and he won't depart from him. That's mm -hmm. what the scripture says. Keep going with verse 16. Verse 16. Mm -hmm. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's right. Come on. And it's profitable uh -huh. for doctrine. Yes, sir. For reproof. Yes, sir. For correction. Uh -huh. For instruction in righteousness. For instructions in righteousness. If you want to be righteous, you have to get instruction. And where do you get that instruction? Right here. This is your instructions in righteousness, right? Yes, right here in your hand. Right here in my hand is the instructions for righteousness. And we see already how well we follow instructions. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So that should show you something, right? Right. You should reflect on that. Don't, don't let these little, these little lessons pass over or go over your head. Use these things to your advantage. Now you know, okay, I'm, I'm lacking a little bit in my instruction uh, following. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
This is how you're going to keep yourself from sin. This is how you're going to keep yourself out of that lake of fire. Okay? This is instructions in righteousness. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Acts 4. Or no, I'm sorry, Acts 10. Acts 10. Acts 10. You need these instructions in righteousness, and you need to follow them exactly as God has written them down. Because I'm going to tell you something. We don't serve a Burger King God. Man. You can't have it your way. Man. It's got to be his way or no way at all. Man. And he's going to tell you something here. Acts 10, verse 34. 10 and 34, read it. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He said, God is a no respecter of persons. So if I'm out there acting crazy... If Fawn is out there acting crazy, Brother Brian, your teachers, we out there acting crazy, God will get us. Mm-hmm. He don't care. There ain't no difference between me and you or the brother on the street. If you are not following his word, he will get you. Man. Okay? He don't care. He does not care. Keep going. 35. Mm-hmm. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. He said, but in every nation... So it's not just for Israel, right? That's right, brother. Not just the Jews. Not just okay, the Jews. so every nation, mm-hmm. he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Right. Everybody can get this thing. You just got to keep his commandments. You got to do it his way. But he is no respect of persons. He'll get at you. Mm-hmm. Let's keep going. First Peter. First Peter 1. Just in case you didn't hear it the first time, I'm going to let Peter tell you. <laughs> first Peter 1. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. 1 Peter 1 and 14. All right, everybody, right there. All right, brother, go ahead. As obedient children, mm-hmm. not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Okay, so as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves after, after your old lifestyle. You, you come to this truth, you've got to have a new, a new way of life. You don't do the things that you used to do when you was... Out in the streets, right? Mm -hmm. Simple. Keep going. But as he which hath called you is holy, Uh so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Okay, that's right. So he that called you is holy, so you got to be holy in all manner of behavior. That's what he's talking about there. He says conversation. He means behavior. He's talking about everything you do. So you like, so again, you can't be out there on the street representing him and talking crazy. You can't be going somewhere, everywhere you go, getting in fisticuffs with somebody talking crazy. He's not like that. You got to be holy because he is holy. That sound that may sound say sound hard to do, but you got to find a way to do it, Israel. You got to find a way. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what the scripture says. We finish that. Sixteen. Come on. Because it is written, "Be ye holy." For I am holy. Uh huh. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. You've got to pass your time here in fear. Pass your time here in fear. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm scared of everything. <laughs> I, I ain't going to lie because I, because I know what this book says. He, look, he killed a man for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. If he's not going to excuse that man, who am I? What's he going to do to me? That's not a just and fair God. If he kills that man, for, if for, he stones that man for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, and he lets me get away scot-free, what kind of just and fair God is that? That's just scare everybody in here. We, we are not going to get a pass. We're going to have to answer for everything that we do. According to his works. According to every man's work, he says. And God is not a respecter of persons. He will murk you. Yep. He will, in false words, <laughs> he, he always says that. He will murk you. Let's go get an example. Somebody who we, we, we know and, uh, that God had a lot of respect for. Moses, right? Yes, sir. He said, I, I talked to Moses face to face as a friend, right? Yep. That shows a pretty good, res- that shows God has a, a little bit of respect in our eyes for Moses, right? Okay, but he's not a respected person. I'm going to show you here. Exodus, Exodus uh, 
4, pick it up at 24. Exodus 4 and 24. All right, brother, go ahead. And it came to pass by the way in the end mm -hmm. that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And, and he sought what? To kill him. He sought to kill Moses. He was going to kill Moses dead. Let's, let's find out why. Go to, ahead. Then Zephora, Zephora took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Moses had forgotten. He had either had forgotten or he neglected to circumcise his son on the eighth day. Mm. And the Lord was waiting in this inn to kill him. Mm. No respect to persons. He going to murk Moses. I know I don't stand a chance. <laughs> I tell you, I ain't nowhere close to Moses' stature. Mm. So that's why I say I'm scared of everything. I got to keep myself right on that straight and narrow mm. as each and every one of us should at all times. Protect yourself at all times and come out fighting. He says, he said, uh, she, she said, she called him, surely thou, surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Verse 26. So he let him go. Uh -huh. Then she said, a bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So this confirms that it was about the circumcision. This is why the Lord was upset with him. The Lord is not going to pardon your sins. He is not going to pardon your sins. He gave, he gave us a specific job to do. Moses failed to do that, and Moses almost paid the consequences. Luckily, he had a wife who knew what she, you know, she knew these scriptures. She knew what, what needed to be done, and she saved his life. So, so don't, you know, don't neglect it. When you got a mate who is in this word too, don't neglect that. Because she can save your life, you know, she can save your life just as well you can save hers. So that is a true blessing when the Lord sends you somebody and both of you guys can be in this word serving together, saving one another, helping one another to get there. That's what it's all about. Numbers 20. Numbers 20. I promise you, he is serious about his, his things, these things. Numbers 20, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. This is a familiar situation we've probably all read a hundred times, but we're going to look at a different angle. Numbers 20 and verse 1, when you get it, brother, come on. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Mm -hmm. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gather themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Okay, so they're they're coming out of they've come out of Egypt, you know, going across this desert. They get to this desert of Zin, and there's no water here. Now at this point, Israel's got to be very thirsty, very tired, and from from uh, counting the numbers. When, 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 uh, when uh, Moses went and numbered the children of Israel, he numbered them. The, when you count off those numbers, they estimate that there is roughly 3 million Israelites out here in this desert at this time. Mm -hmm. Roughly 3 million here, okay? And they say, now I'm not, you know, real good with the science of the matter, so I, I just take the word for this. They say for 3 million people, you're going to need roughly 11 million gallons of water a day to, plus the cattle. Wow. that they had out there. You're going to need 11 million gallons of water a day to, for these people to survive. That's a lot. So you can understand why they're murmuring about water, right? Yeah. You can understand why they're upset about this water situation. Verse 3. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? Mm -hmm. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die here? Okay, so Israel, you know, we, we know we're going someplace better, but we ain't getting there fast enough. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? We, we ain't got no patience, all right? I can, look, look, I, can, I know McDonald's is on the other side of that hill. Let's, you know, let's go and get over there and get that, you know? We ain't got no patience at all. So they're ready to go back. Come on, verse 5. And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us unto this evil place? Mm -hmm. It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. Okay, so they're, they're in slavery, you know, for a while. 
And, uh, you know, now they're out here in the desert, and they feel like they had a crack in this slavery. That's stupid. <laughs> we, were, we were ready to go back. We ain't got nothing out here. This is a desert. So they, they, they're banging on Moses and Aaron hard here. Come on. Keep going. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces. Mm -hmm. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Uh -huh. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, What he say? Take the rod, mm -hmm. and gather thou the assembly together thou and Aaron thy brother and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes and it shall give forth his water and thou shall bring forth to them water out of the rock so shall thou give the congregation and their beasts drink okay so the Lord gave them instructions on what to do here right mm -hmm. simple instructions I don't see nothing here too difficult do you he said speak ye unto the rock before their eyes and it give and 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 it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. That's all he had to do. Simple instructions, right? Okay, let's see, what, let's see if Moses followed them strict, simple instructions. Come on. Verse 9. Come on. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Uh -huh. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses. That's good. I'm... <laughs> right. <laughs> and you, because you know he was, you know he was feeling it. Uh -huh. I look. I've been all day long listening <laughs> to you brothers moan and complain about this water, and now I know I can get the water from this rock. I'm about to let you have it. You, you know, he's look. Must I get water from this from, from this rock, you rebels? He let them have it now. But simple instructions. You know, he let, he let Israel get him out of his lane. He let Israel take him off the task a right, little bit, right. and now he's going to have to pay the consequences of that mm. because the Lord is not playing. Verse 10. Verse oh, no. I'm sorry. 11. 11. Go ahead. And Moses lifted up his hand. Uh-huh. And with his rod, he smote the rock twice. So where did he get that? That wasn't nowhere in the instructions. <laughs> you know. But we got, you know, we're Israel. We, 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 uh, you know, we got to be a spectacle. We got to, we got to do something. I can't just stand here and talk. You got to let, the, you got to do something. So I'm de tap on the rock. Look, come on. And the water came out abundantly. Uh huh. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Okay, so, so, everything going as planned. Water, you know, he did his thing, and water still came out of the rock. So Israel got the water that they needed. So everything should be cool, right? Everything should be good. You know, you know, maybe I got away with this. You know, let's see what happened. Come Verse on. 12. 12. Come on. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, uh -huh. because ye believe me not mm -hmm. to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given mm -hmm. them. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they're going to go through some stuff. They're going to go through some stuff. And now, now Moses, he's telling Moses and Aaron, you didn't believe me, so you ain't even going to get where I'm taking you. Mm. Simply just because they didn't follow some simple instructions. Simple instructions. This is awesome. See, he couldn't have told me this. Not at this point. Hey, you couldn't, I wouldn't lead Israel across the street after this. <laughs> I'd be so mad. Ain't no way. Yeah, the, you, you didn't look, Trav. I'm, I'm, you know, I got something for you, but I'll, I'll wait till you get them there, over there. Then I'll tell you what. You couldn't have told me this right now. Mm-mm. <laughs> I'd be hot. Okay, let's keep moving. Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. You got to follow these instructions that the Lord gives you to a T. We're going to look at a couple brothers here who didn't follow the instructions and they got hot too. Leviticus 10. Going to pick it up at verse 1. With 10 and 1. Leviticus 10 and verse 1. Everybody got it? All right, come on. And Nadab uh -huh. and Abihu, uh -huh. the sons of Aaron, uh -huh. took either of him, either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Okay, so Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, obviously, they're Levites. They have been assigned a duty, okay? The Lord has set, set up, this is, this, this is approximately 
a year after they have been brought out of, Israel, uh, out of Egypt, okay? And so the Lord has, has set up his priesthood, and he's, he's getting everything set up, all right? So everybody has a specific job, and Nadab and Abihu's job is these, censor, these censors, these incense, okay? That's, that's, that's their job. But they messed around and offered strange fire before the Lord. What does that mean? So with the incense... They had to get the fire. They had to get the fire from the brazen altar. I think it's in Exodus uh, 38. You can, you can read that on your own time. Exodus 38. You're supposed to get the you're supposed to get the fire from the brazen altar. They probably what they did since it's strange fire. They probably took a match or something and lit it. Lit, lit the incense. That's not what the Lord told them to do. That's not following instructions. So what happened? Verse two. Mm -hmm. And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now you can imagine. You know, I don't, I don't know how the you know the the uh, construct of the sensors. I don't know if they're on on two poles and they're like balls. You know, I'm not sure how that how mm -hmm. that works. But you can just imagine those sensors just blew up on them and caught them in fire. Or maybe he sent down fire from heaven and consumed them. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100, 100 on that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I do know that the fire devoured them. Right. They wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Following a simple instruction could have saved their life. Simple instruction. Mm. I don't want to get burned up like that. But let's finish that. Verse 3. Mm -hmm. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Mm -hmm. And before all the people will I be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Couldn't even complain. He said, this is that I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Anybody that comes near the Lord, anybody that comes near that tabernacle, comes near that presence, has to be right. Yeah. Or he would kill them. He would kill them dead. He told the see when they set that when they set up that tabernacle, they had each of the tri tribes surrounded in in particular places. He said, "The stranger don't even come up to that tabernacle, or I will kill him dead." So you have to be careful with this what, what the Lord says, or at any time your life could be taken. That's how serious it is. And I'm saying we see this now in the Old Testament, but tell me why it's any different for us. Simply because the Lord is long-suffering, it's, it's, it is it's not his will that any of us should perish. So some of us count it as slackness, right? Mm. So we think, okay, well, I got away with it today. You know, no big deal. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you're going to have to answer for everything you do. You're going to have to answer for that. So it really, it is no different for them as it is for us. No difference. We just may not get struck down today. But if you, you rack up too many of these offenses, and it might be today, mm -hmm. that scale, you know, that scale, you start tipping that scale, you got to be careful, brothers and sisters. You don't know how your life is in peril. Right. Oh, right. Your life is in peril. Did, didn't Jesus say you, your time is all the way? You got to be careful, brothers and sisters. Matthew 12. So let's look at, let's look at a particular holy thing here. Well, let's begin to look at a particular holy thing. Because we see here Nadab and Abihu didn't handle this holy thing correctly, and they lost their life. And, then, and, the, and really, like I said, they had, the Lord has just set them up. They hadn't even been doing this thing very long. Mm -hmm. And the Lord still murked them. Mm -hmm. Matthew 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 12 and 1. Let me get there. All right, brother, go ahead. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Mm -hmm. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Okay, so... Jesus and the disciples, I, I, would, I would guess that they're, you know, outside of the city limits because not, not very many places do you, you know, sow corn in the, in the city. You know what I'm saying? So they're kind of outside. The, I would assume they're kind of outside the city and because and, and, I'm trying to get a visual picture that the, the Pharisees are watching them so tough, they follow them out of the city to see what they're <laughs> going to do on the Sabbath day, right? right. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the image that I get. 
So they pick this corn, and the, and the Pharisees jump up. Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day, looking for him to do something wrong. Verse 3. But he said unto them, mm -hmm. Have you not read what David did when he was unhungered? Uh -huh. And they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful for him to eat, uh -huh. neither for them that which were with him, but only for the priests. Okay, so let's pause a second here. He said how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread. Okay, so David and his band who was running from Saul, they went into the house of God and they did eat the showbread, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, it says that this was not lawful for him to eat. So what is it about the showbread that is so special that a man can't eat the showbread? It would behoove you to find out, wouldn't it? Mm. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to put a pin in that for a second, but that is something we're going to keep in mind. Why couldn't David go in there and eat the showbread? Let's see, we're going to find out what is so special about this showbread. It says, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. So the showbread is only for the priests. So we do get a little bit of instruction there. We do know that the showbread is only for the priests. So there is a little instruction there that we need to follow. Verse 5. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Uh -huh. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Mm -hmm. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You have not condemned the guiltless. That's right. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Okay, so the priest, he say, verse 5, he's talking about the priest doing things in the temple to profane, that, that, to profane the Sabbath day. They got different jobs. Not everybody can be doing the same thing on the Sabbath day. When the, when the brothers travel to Las Vegas, they got to they gotta have gas in the vehicles to get there, right? So is it lawful for them to purchase gas on that day so that they can further the ministry? Absolutely. But for you, if you're just going across town, you need to wait till after the Sabbath day, right? Mm -hmm. So some things ain't for everybody on the Sabbath day. The Lord has certain jobs for certain, pe for certain individuals mm -hmm. to be doing, okay? He said, he said, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple because they talking crazy. And it's look, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't even be standing around here talking crazy to me. Right. I'm greater than the temple. I'm the one that made the Sabbath day. I'm the creator of this thing. So I can judge who can do what and what should be done on the Sabbath day. Quit tripping. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath, he said. Mm -hmm. Let's go. We finished that, right? Yes, okay. So let's go now to Mark. Same account. But he's going to give us just a little bit more information here. We're going to glean just a little bit more information. Mark 2. <coughs> Since we're being so careful with the instructions, we need to get all the information we, that's available here. So we're going to glean just a little bit more here. Mark 2 and verse 23. 2 and 23. Come on. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Okay, so obviously this is the same account, just told by a different person. Keep going. And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had, when he had need? And was in hunger, he and they that were with him. Mm -hmm. How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. That's right. So, okay, again, he said the showbread is it's not lawful for them to eat except for the priest. And he gave also to them who were with him. Okay, keep going. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. Okay, so Sabbath is made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It doesn't make any sense that a man should perish on the Sabbath day for being hungry. Hmm. That makes no sense. Hmm. He does not serve the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is there to serve man. So it makes no sense that you would let a man starve on the Sabbath day. Hmm. Right? Verse 28. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That's right. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He's the creator of the Sabbath day. And he's telling you it just makes no sense that you should let a man perish 
on the Sabbath day for hunger. Luke, let's go to Luke 6. We're going to get just a little bit more. Luke 6. Luke 6, and we're going to pick this up at verse 6. And this, and when we're picking this up, this is an extension of what we, where we just ended. It's the same, it's right after the same event. I mean, the same event precedes this, but we're kind of picking up just after where we left off in Mark, per se. You get what I'm saying? I'm kind of adding to it, but we're picking up it just where Mark finished. Because you look in verse 5, he said, he said the same thing where we just left in Mark. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So we're picking it up in verse 6, finishing that. Go ahead. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath. Also on another Sabbath. So, so uh, he, he, he didn't just keep one Sabbath. There's obviously multiple Sabbaths here. You can't have another unless you did it before, right? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> All right, go ahead. That he entered into the synagogue and taught. Mm -hmm. So, and, so there, there again, we, I always like to point this out for you know somebody who don't know, you know, might be their first time watching. You know, why are these people are here on Saturdays? This is what the Lord did regularly on the Sabbath day. Went into the synagogue to teach. Mm. And there he says, there was a man there whose whose right hand was withered. Come on. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him. Always watching him. Come on. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. Always watching him. They're always watching him closely so they can find fault in something he does. Yeah. Now, is this not common to Israel or is it not? Gracious. I'm just, I'm just saying. Ooh, I'm just saying. Carry on. <laughs> Verse 8. <laughs> but he knew their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up. And stand forth in the midst. Uh -huh. And he arose and stood forth. So, so Jesus peeped out the game before, before it happened. And so he, he preempted them. He says, he telling the man, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then what? Then said Jesus unto them, mm -hmm. I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, uh -huh. to save life or to destroy? Good question. What are they going to do? Come on. And looking round about them all, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Mm -hmm. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. So they were going to stone him for doing good on the Sabbath day. And the reason why I, I, I wanted to continue this on, even though it's getting off of the showbread, which we're focusing on, I want to show you something. This lesson, this whole deal that we're talking about today is focusing on following instructions, right? Yeah. Okay, being very careful to follow God's instructions, right? But you can't follow God's instructions to the point where it overrides your common sense. If somebody is starving, give that man something to eat. If you don't, if you don't have nothing in the house, go, go and buy that person something to eat on the Sabbath day if you have to. Feed that man. Don't let them perish. That makes no sense, right? I'm just saying you got to think about it. Think about it a little bit. Don't let your, don't let, you know, don't let it override your common sense, but be, but do your due diligence. Be very careful and do your due dil diligence. Mm -hmm. We finished that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, since we're talking about David in the showbread, let's go look at it. First Samuel 21. Let's go get a firsthand account of what happened here and see why David is tripping. He's a man after God's own heart. He know he ain't supposed to be in the, in the synagogue eating the showbread, right? Yeah. Surely he knows that. He knows that all right. <clears throat> so let's go see what this is about. Why is David tripping? 1 Samuel 21 and verse 1. 21 and verse 1. All right, brother, go ahead. Then came David to Nob, mm -hmm. to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David uh -huh. and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? Okay, so Ahimelech, the high priest there, he's afraid when David comes in because Saul, David is running from Saul. And Saul has put out the word, if anybody sees David, let me know. 
If you don't let me know, I'm going to get at you, mm -hmm. right? So this is why Ahimelech is, is afraid when he sees David. Why art thou alone and no man with thee, he says. Verse 2. And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and mm -hmm. hath sent me. Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Okay, now, I don't want to call David a liar. <laughs> but, well, I'm going to let that go. <laughs> he told him a story here so that he could, uh, you know, accomplish the little mission that he's, you know, he's trying to, you know, he's on here with his men. He's trying to get his men a little something to eat. So he told the priest here something, you know, something that he thought would help him to, to accomplish his goal. <laughs> Verse 3. Now, therefore, what is under thine hand? <laughs> Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what is that? What there is present? Okay, so you know we're on this mission, you know, for for us all, for the king. You know, uh, we have nothing. To give us something to eat. Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever you got present. What's the priest answer? And the priest answered David and said, "There is no common bread under mine hand, but uh -huh. there is hollow bread. There is what kind of bread? Hollow bread. Hollow bread. Hallowed bread. That means a special bread, right? Yep." That means that has some important, that's some important bread right there, right? Mm -hmm. But what else? If the young man have kept themselves at least from women. Well, hold on a minute. Hold, re read that again. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. I know Dave was like, well, hold on. Maybe you didn't hear me. I wanted some bread. <laughs> right. I came in here just for some bread, right? Right. He said, well, if you, you, you kept yourself from women, what that got to do with bread? I just, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, he couldn't even believe it. I know he, I, I, I'd have been like, wait, I know he didn't, man. Let me explain to you one more time. Just, just no, you got to keep, if you had yourself <laughs> from women, you know, I might can do something for you. But verse, uh, where are you at? Five. Five. Read it. And David answered the priest and said unto him, of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days mm -hmm. since I came out. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> And the, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in the manner common, yea, though it was sanctified this day in the vessel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, look, I know, look, it's been three days. I'm hungry, you know, probably ain't had no, you know, look, man. But he just wants some bread. <laughs> right. But we kept, we have been without, you know, the contact of women for three whole days. Hey, yeah. We are clean. He says, I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So they got, he's got this showbread that has been sanctified, and it's in this vessel. It's in the particular place that the showbread is supposed to be, a particular place that the showbread is kept. We're going to look at that as well. All these things, we're going to look and see how it's handled. But he's saying, this is what I have. Verse 6. So the priest gave him hollow bread mm -hmm. for there was no bread but there but th there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away okay so we know that he, so now we know what jesus is talking about we have gone to the source and we see what ha what what transpired here all right so they gave him the show bread now <coughs> excuse me let's let's get an understanding of what this showbread is or what it, rep, what it may represent. Let's see if we can determine what it represents because it's a hallowed bread. So you don't just take any old loaf of bread and just pray over it and call it hallowed and call it sacred, right? It must be something to this. So we're going to see if we can figure out exactly what does this bread got to do? Why is it so important? Why is it so important? Let's go first to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. Because the Lord don't he don't just have us doing stuff, these, you know, these keeping the Sabbath day just to keep us, you know, busy, you know, keeping right. the, when the feast days come around, we don't just keep the feast days, just to get some exercise and the fellowship and just to, you know, drink a little bit, have an excuse. He, no, it, those things mean something. Yes, sir. Every one of those things means something and it's supposed to show you something. You're supposed to learn something from these <coughs> tasks that you are doing. Hebrews 8, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13 and move straight into verse, or chapter 9. Because verse eight, verse, or chapter 8 
is, is a continuation, or in verse, or chapter 9 is a continuation from what he's talking about in, in chapter 8. Right. So we're just going to get what we need of, in verse 13 and move right into, into chapter 9. So go ahead. In that he saith, a new covenant, he made first the old, the, he made first, I'm sorry, he hath made the first old. Mm -hmm. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Okay, so... He, he says in that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now, he didn't say here that he did away with the old, right? Correct. Did not say that. Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to make that plain. He says, which, he said, now that, with, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away, but it ain't done away with. Right. Okay, keep going. Hebrews 9, starting yeah. at verse 1. Yes, sir. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay, the first covenant, the Old Testament, the Old Testament laws, we had, we had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. That's the worldly sanctuary that was that tabernacle that they built, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and they had divine services, divine things that they did in that tabernacle. They, they did the sacrifices there. They had all these, we're going to read about all these things, the candlesticks, the table, the Ark of the Covenant, all these things in that tabernacle. These all things are ordinances and divine services of the Lord, okay? Very specific and important things, holy things. Mm. Verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was called the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread, uh -huh. which is called the sanctuary. That's right. So those are some things that are in this sanctuary. And we see, we see here that the show bread is in this sanctuary. So, that, so he mentions candlestick and some other things here. So that lets us know that he is talking about holy things, right? Yes, sir. Some very important holy things. Verse 3. And after the second... The veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. The holiest of all, it says, right? Yes, sir. All right, come on. Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. Uh-huh. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we, not, we cannot now speak particularly. Okay, so... If you're not familiar with the, with, the, uh, with the structure of the tabernacle, okay, it's a, it's a, it's a I've ever fond of referred to it like a $5 million tent, right? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so it's a tent. It had a lot of bling. It was a very special, very expensive tent. It had two chambers, okay? When you come in, it had two chambers. The first chamber is kind of a common area. The second is divided by a veil. Yes, sir, on the other veil, on the other side of that veil, or the other chain is the other chamber which holds the ark of the covenant, the mercy, or called or the, or the mercy seat. Right? Yeah. You do not. Only Aaron is allowed to go on the other side of that veil. Yes, sir. Okay. Only Aaron. That is that is very important. You will lose your life if you go on the other side of that veil. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is the this is the structure of this of this tabernacle, okay? Uh, where are we at? Verse 6. Okay, so we got, we got the, uh, on the, in the first, in the first chamber of this tabernacle is where the golden censer is, or no, where the, uh, okay. where the candlestick and the table and the showbread, these things, that's what's in the first, the first chamber of this tabernacle. And this, in the, in the other side of the veil, in the other chamber is the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, and the mercy seat, the, and Aaron's, the, the rod of, that, of Aaron's rod that budded. Yes. Okay, so those are the things that are on the other side of the, of the, of the veil. All right, verse 6, let's go, uh, where are you at? Verse 7. Verse 6. Verse 6, verse 6, come on. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Okay, so the priests were allowed to go into the first tabernacle. That was allowed. And I'm sure they were very careful to keep those instructions. Verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood. Not without blood. If he went in there without that blood, bye-bye. Come on. Which he offered for himself... And for the heirs of the people. Uh-huh. So the, the blood had specific, it had a specific reason for him to go in there. And this one time a year, you Bible scholars, you know what time this is. What time is it? Day of atonement. Thank you. Come on. All right. Come on. Verse 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, 
that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Okay, so the Holy, so the Holy Ghost signifies, so the scripture signifying that the way into the holiest of all, the, the, the way to the other side of that tabernacle was not yet, not yet made manifest. Mm. Only one person was allowed to go through there. So this one person must represent something, mm. right? Mm. So these little things, the Lord had them doing, all these things, you, you, you have to look at it. Don't let it go over your head. You have to look at that and see, why is he doing this? Why is only Aaron able to go here? Right. What did Aaron represent according to these people? What does the showbread represent? Mm. Well, you know, these things, these things mean something because they point to a future. Mm. They point to future events, okay? So there, it's not... It's not always just good reading. There's something to glean from even the smallest of details. Yes, sir. Something to glean from this. So, he says, uh, where were you at? Okay, the, verse 8, the Holy, sig the Holy Ghost signif this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. So, we're not, we lost access to the mercy seat. Mm. We lost access in the Garden of Eden to God, didn't we? Mm. So you can see some, see some things pointing to one to the other, right? Yes, sir. So you have to pay attention to the small details. Um, Nine. While, his, while the first tabernacle was yet standing, so while the first tabernacle, tabernacle was yet standing, we had no access to, that, to the other side of that veil. Verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present, mm -hmm. and which will offer both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Okay, so which was a figure for that time in the then present. So in other words, a shadow of things to come, mm. right? Pointing to something in the future that could not make him that did the service perfect. It didn't, those things, doing those jobs didn't make us perfect, make but it helped us to show God we are willing to follow you. We're going to do what we can, to, you know, to keep your word and, and uh, you know, be good, servants, be good servants of God. Yes, sir. Okay. We finished that. Verse 10. Verse 10. Come on. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances mm -hmm. imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. Okay. Until the time, till this different time. Verse 11. But Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Okay, so it is something, it is something that this is all pointing to. Okay, now let's go and look at this uh, in Exodus 25. Mm -hmm. Exodus 25. Just that dope right here. Mm -hmm. Exodus 25. And we're going to pick it up at verse 23. Exodus 25, and we're going to pick it up at verse 23. All right, brother, go ahead. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Okay, so this is, this is one of them things where you start reading, and he starts talking about, you know, 400 cubits by 300 cubits by 200 cubits by 7 cubits, and you start like, man, I mean, it gets so mundane. You, you, start, you start looking, okay, what can I skip down to that makes some sense for me? <laughs> But you can't, you can't always skip down, brothers. This is, sometimes the devil is in the details, and you kind of need to know what he's talking about here. Mm -hmm. And especially if it is your job to complete this task, you better be on point when you, you, when you go to build this thing. Mm. Now, I took the trouble uh, to look this up because that's what we do. That's what we do. Okay, it said uh, two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. That's about three feet long and one and a half feet wide, two and, two and, uh, two and a quarter feet high. That's the dimensions of this table, all right? You're welcome. <laughs> verse, verse 32. 24. Oh, yeah, wherever we're at. <laughs> and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. Mm-hmm. And make there too a crown of gold round about. Okay, so now we got this table, 
and he has overlaid it with pure gold. So this table obviously is important, right? Yeah. I mean, because not, you know, if you poor like me, you don't just have a table around the house and overlay with pure gold. Right. I mean, not, any, not even one that I got spray painted gold. <laughs> right. So this is obviously an important table. It's got, some, it's got a lot of bling to it. Verse 25. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a handbreadth round about. That's about three and a half inches. That's a handbreadth. But go ahead. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. Okay, so round about, you got to make this, you got to make this border round about it, three and a half inches all the way around about. Okay, keep going. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the, that are on the four feet thereof. Okay, now see these, mm. like I said now, when you're reading through this on your own time, you know, you get, you, you, you probably already been reading for a little bit and you get to this and now you're tired. You're like, man, you know, four rings, this and four, two cubits. And so you just like skip over. I don't care. I just, you know, I just can't, I can't handle this right now, Lord. So, but, but that's what we're here for to kind of help you through this. Right. So you got four rings on each end of this table, four rings on each end of the table. All right. Those rings are important. Because this, this table, remember, is made, of, is made of gold. It's overlaid with gold. Gold is heavy. Yeah. Okay? So you uh -huh. ain't just going to pick this joint up and just walk off with it. All right. So you got four rings around the corner, right? Keep going. 27. Read it. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table. Okay, so the, the rings are for the staves or for a staff to slide through each, each end of the table so that you can bear the table, so you can lift that table, right? Now, pay attention to instructions because you can't just put anything in there. This is a heavy table. Hmm. You just go get some, 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 some sticks off the, out, you know, out from anywhere. You try to lift that thing, it's going to break. Snap. The Lord is thinking ahead for you. He yeah. already thought all this out. He's going he's to solve that problem for you. Go ahead. 28. Read it. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood. Strong, strong wood that stuff is. You keep going. And overlay them with gold. Even they got bling. Now come on. That the table may be born with them. Uh-huh. Because they, now the shittim wood is able to bear the weight of this, of this, uh, this table, mm. which also has gold things on it. We're going to see that in a minute. But it is, it, is, uh, it is made of shittim wood, and it is also overlaid with gold, and it is able to bear the weight of this table. Verse 29. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, mm -hmm. and the spoons thereof, and the covers thereof, and the bowls thereof, to cover with all mm -hmm. of pure gold shall thou make them. Of pure gold. So all these things, this table is made of gold. The stays are made of gold. The, 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 the spoons, the covers thereof, the bowls, all these things are made of gold on this table. Okay. This is a heavy table and this is a, a quite expensive table. Mm -hmm. All right. Verse, th uh, you finished that verse 30, verse 30, 30. Come on. And thou and thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Okay, so the showbread, he didn't put no gold on that. <laughs> it can be kind of hard to eat that. Yeah. But of all these things in gold, he puts the showbread on this table. Hmm. So this letting you know, okay, this, this showbread is really something important. Wow. It is really something. So let's keep going here. John 6. What could this showbread mean? What could it represent? John 6. It's that dope, man. Praise God. Mm -hmm. That's it right here. John 6. <clears throat> 6 and we're going to pick it up at verse 30. John 6 and verse 30. All right, brother, when you get it, go ahead. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? Mm -hmm. what, does thou what does thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Okay. For the bread of God is he 
which cometh down from heaven and giveth light unto the world. Okay, so we, we, we got Jesus here talking to, these, mm. talking to these people here. And he say, you know, they're talking about our fathers gave, did give us, uh, did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's scripture, right? Mm. Okay. And, and Jesus said, verily I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Although the manna rained down from heaven, it is not that bread, that, 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 he, that, uh, that true bread that, that came from the Father. It represented something else. Mm. The Father gives you that true bread from heaven he's talking about. And who do you think he's talking about? Christ. He's talking about himself, right? Mm -hmm. for, he, for, the, for the bread of God, do you read that verse 33? Yes, sir. Okay, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth light, life unto the world. Bread doth, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word. word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So this bread, so the, so the symbol of bread represents a couple of different things here. Mm -hmm. It represents the word. It also, it, it also represents Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. it, also, it also represents physical food. Mm -hmm. Simple. Mm -hmm. Not a hard thing. Uh, 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Uh, give us some of this bread. Come on. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And so he is, he's telling them flat out, I am the bread of life. Come on. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Uh -huh. But I said unto you, that he also have seen me and believe not. Okay, so Jesus is the bread of life, okay? So, so we, can, we can start kind of putting some pieces together, you know, start, we, can, we, got, a pu we got the puzzle pieces on the table, mm -hmm. now we can start putting a little bit of it together. So Jesus is that bread of life, okay? We know that the show bread is something special. Mm -hmm. Not anybody, just anybody could walk in there and eat that show bread. Mm -hmm. Only the priest were allowed to eat that show bread, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the priest. The priests are sanctified, right? Yes, sir. They're holy, right? To, I mean, you, for, for intents and purposes, they were holy. They were a holy people, right? Yes, sir. So, that showbread was only for them. They, only, the, only those who are keeping God's commandments could partake of that showbread, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. You want the bread of life. The only way you can partake of that is yeah. to accept Jesus. Yes, sir. Right? You see where he's going with that? Yes, sir. You see how the symbol, point, one thing points to another? You can't overlook the showbread. When he tells you, he tells you don't eat that showbread, you better not eat it. The, <laughs> Paul, told, Paul tells us, um, I, I forgot, it's in Corinthians, Corinthians, don't take partake of this Pass bread on. unworthily. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. These things mean something. Good stuff. You got to be careful what you're doing. You got to know what you're doing. And, and I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, you got to be careful with this word because if you're not careful, you're going you're gonna to be doing something you shouldn't be doing, and then you're going to tell somebody else wrong. Hmm. And now you got everybody messed up. Hmm. And that's why we're in, this, we're in the spot we're in today. We didn't do, we weren't careful back then what we're supposed to be doing and now the whole world is all messed up mm. because somebody wasn't careful with the scriptures and we are in a bad state so you got to be very careful and very very serious about this word because one thing leads to another mm. it's a domino effect mm. anyway stop me from flapping where are you at 37 read it all that the father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Uh -huh. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's right. Come on. And this is the Father's will which, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, mm -hmm. but should raise it up at the last day. When? At the last day. So you don't just die and go off to heaven. At the last day. So you raised up at the last day. At the last okay, day. Okay, well, you got to wait. I'm just making sure. You know, I, I hear little things like that, and I'm like, wait a minute. I know I was told something different. I got to confirm, but come on. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone would see if the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Hmm, he said it again. He must be serious about that, but come on. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And you know what they're fixing to do. They're yeah. looking to stone him. Every, Jesus always had, had them ready to rock him to sleep. Always. <laughs> it's just a simple thought. Look, I am the bread of life. They knew what that meant. 
But that's just a simple thing he said, and they're ready to stone him. Right. Always on him. Always on him. But we see the importance here. We know who this bread represents now. Yes, sir. We can see that. Let's go to Leviticus 24. Praise God. Praise God. It's that cocaine cowboy right here. <laughs> Leviticus 24. It's good stuff. Pure and cut. We're going to pick it up at verse 5. <clears throat> Leviticus 24, we're going to pick it up at verse 5. All right, brother, when you get it, go ahead and read. And thou shalt take the fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deal shall be in one cake. Okay, so we're kind of getting, uh, it looks like we're getting ingredients for how the bread is prepared, right? Mm -hmm. Now what it looks like, you, you need flour to make bread. I'm not, I'm not, I'm no chef by any means. I mean, I can cook a hamburger, you know, <laughs> but I'm, I, that, praise God for my wife. <laughs> he shall order the, her, and thou shalt take Fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Twelve cakes. Now that should that should ring a uh, you know some some bells here. Uh, twelve cakes. What do you think that represents? Twelve tribes. Okay. Now he's gonna bake these twelve cakes and he's gonna where you think he's gonna put them? On, on the, the on the table. on the table, right? Yep. All right. Come on. Verse six. And thou shalt set them in two rows. Uh huh. Six on one row upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now see, because I've studied this, you know, over and over again, every time I read this stuff, it gives me goose pimples. Because I can see what the Lord is doing and how these things must match up. Now he's got, he's got, you know, the 12 showbreads, six on each side. We know that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. He says... He says, and thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row. We, we can see what happened when Jesus was crucified. The women came and what'd they, what'd they, what'd they uh, put on his body? Frankincense. frankincense. You see all this stuff? Yes, he, the Lord is cold. <laughs> man. He is cold-blooded, man. <laughs> I mean, all this stuff is airtight. <sighs> I, don't know, I, I, I don't know how you can, man, you, couldn't be, <laughs> you can't read this and be no atheist. Straight up. It don't make no sense. Anyway. Verse 8. Verse 8, come on. Every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. Every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. They did this without fail. Every Sabbath. This shows you this is something very important that is done every single Sabbath day. Continually. Keep, keep going. Being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. An everlasting covenant, he says. An everlasting covenant. Verse 9. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, mm -hmm. and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire for a, by a perpetual statue. He said, and they shall eat it in the holy place, so it can only be eaten in a specific place, and for it is most holy. Most holy. Offering. He, see, he could have just said it is holy, but he said it is most holy. This letting you know this bread represents the real deal here. Yes, sir. It is most holy unto him, the offerings of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual statute. That's without end, brothers and sisters. Yes, sir. That is without end. That's, this, this bread here means something. Mm -hmm. We finish that. Yes, sir. Okay. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. You could not tell me, you can't tell me David didn't know what this bread meant when he went in there with his, with his, with his band of boys and they had to eat <laughs> that show bread. He knew what that bread meant, but he also knew, he also knew that he couldn't let, he couldn't let his overzeal, uh, his zeal overrule his common sense. Right. Very careful to keep the word of God but still using some common sense. We're going, we're going to see here, we're in, a, where are we at? Second Chronicles 2, verse 3. 2 and 3, come on. And Solomon sent to Hiram, mm -hmm. the king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David my father, and didst send him cedars to build him a house to dwell therein, 
Even so, deal with me. Okay, so higher, higher, this is, it says Huron, but it's, well, I, we know it's, uh, you know, because the Bible t- changes some names. This, his, his name was Hiram. He was from Tyree, the king of Tyree. And Solomon is dealing with Hiram. He's telling, he's telling him, he says, look, I know you dealt with my father beforehand. Will you so deal with me? I'm getting ready to build something magnificent to the Lord, which is the temple. Because David wanted to do this. He wanted to build this temple, but his hands were too bloody. The Lord told him, you can't do that. Right. So Solomon is accomplishing that task. And now he's seeking materials where he can get them. And the materials he's seeking at this time come, are, are going to come from Hiram, the king of Tyre. Verse 4. Behold, I build a house to the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him uh-huh. and to burn before him sweet incense and for the continual showbread and for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and on the solemn feasts of the Lord our God. Uh huh. This is an ordinance forever to okay. Israel. Okay. So he's telling he, he's telling Hiram, I'm going to build this 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 uh, house to the name of the Lord my God. He says, and to burn before him the sweet incense and for continual showbread. He mentions the showbread here. Mm. He's just asking him for materials. But this showbread is so important that he he bothers to mention this to this dude he's seeking materials to. You see what I'm saying? How little things like this show you just how important it is. Even Solomon at this time knows how important this showbread is and that it is for a burnt offering morning, evening, and on the Sabbath. He knows this. So this, this lets you know this is something that's passed down because you, it is an ordinance forever. You're not going to get past it. Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, one verse here, verse 30. Just driving home the point here of how important this showbread is. Like my brother Fawn always says, very tactical. Mm -hmm. Exodus 25, verse 30, come on. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Always. So this is something he wants done always. 26 and 35. Flip over one page, 26, verse 35. When you get it, go ahead. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, Mm -hmm. and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. So he, again, the Lord, very specific in what he wants done. He said, and thou shalt, he says here, uh, it was that 35. And thou shalt set the table without the veil. So we're talking about inside the tabernacle in the first chamber without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. It had to be in a specific spot in that chamber. He is very specific where he wants this. And I'm telling you, if it isn't done right, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to lose their life. Very tactical. Exodus 40. If you don't get these instructions right, it is very possible that you will lose your life. Mm. And what's even worse, it could mean your salvation. Mm. Exodus 40, verse 22. Exodus 40, verse 22, come on. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. Mm -hmm. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. Uh And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation over against the table on the side of the tabernacle southward. So he's following these instructions precisely as it was given unto him, right? Yeah. Because he don't want to lose his life. Hmm. And I wouldn't either. I mean, I'd be in there with the ruler measuring it out. I'll make sure it's right. Not gonna, you, you might get me for something, but it ain't going to be this. Right. Keep going. 25. 25. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord mm-hmm. as the Lord commanded Moses. That's it. That's, it. That's right. See, he, even these lamps mean something. This candlestick was even built to specific weight. Yeah. The candlestick was built to a specific weight. 
That is details, man. I mean, the Lord is serious about these holy things. Serious about it. Second Chronicles 4, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Second Chronicles 4. We're going to see here just how serious he is. Second Chronicles 2, or yeah. That's uh, Second Chronicles four. And we're gonna pick it up at verse nineteen. Yes, sir. All right. All right, brother, go ahead. And Solomon made all the vessels that were for the house of God, the golden altar, the golden altar also, and the tables whereon the showbread was set. Uh huh. Moreover. The candlesticks with their lamps that they should burn after the manner before the oracle of pure gold. Uh -huh. And the flowers and the lamps and the tongs made he of gold and that perfect gold. Mm -hmm. And the snuffers and the basins and the spoons and the censers of pure gold and the entry of the house, the inner doors thereof, of, for the most holy place. Mm -hmm. And the doors of the house of the temple were gold. That's right. So, so, so we see Moses set up, that, that set up the, the, uh, the table and all these holy things on the table in a specific spot. When, when Solomon built the, the, uh, the, the uh, temple, he did the exact same thing. Followed the instructions to the letter and put these things in a specific place. And, they, and, and, uh, and everything was exactly as the Lord had said it should be done without fail. So we see these brothers following the Lord's instructions to a T. Mm. These things are written for our admonition, brothers and sisters. We're supposed to learn something from this. Numbers 4, getting real close here, almost done. Mm -hmm. Numbers 4. See it right there. Yeah, man. Numbers 4, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 4 and 1. Good stuff. <clears throat> All right, brother, go ahead. And the Lord spake unto Moses and, and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi after their families by the house of their fathers from 30 years old and upward even unto 50 years old. All that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay, so he said, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath. In other words, Tell me, count the number of, of Kohath and tell me how many there are. Okay, so count, count, up, count up the sons of Kohath. He says, for uh, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. He's counting them up for a specific job. Okay, Kohath, the sons of Kohath are going to have a specific job. Verse 4. This shall be the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation about the most holy things. Okay, so they are being assigned a specific job in the tabernacle of the congregation about what? The, the most, most holy things. So they are going to be handling God's most holy things, mm. right? Hmm. So it would be very, if you're one of the sons of Kohath, Kohath it would behoove you to be very sure of how to handle these holy things, right? Preach. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> and when the camp set it forward, Aaron shall come and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Okay. Aaron and his sons shall come and his, and his sons, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. So it was Aaron and his son's jobs to cover the ark of the, the, the testimony with that veil. Okay, we're, we're looking at some specific duties being performed here. Verse 6. And shall put thereon the covering of badger skin, uh -huh. and shall spread it over, and shall spread over it a cloth wholly of blue, and shall put in the staves thereof. Okay, even the badger skins, the cloth, they all, they had to be a specific color. He's serious about this thing, mm. okay? And Aaron and his sons are, are doing this duty. They are doing this preparation. Keep going. And upon the table of showbread, uh -huh. they shall spread a cloth of blue uh -huh. and put thereon the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and covers to cover withal, and the continual bread shall be thereon. Okay, so it is 
Aaron and his sons, the, the high priest, to, to, uh, they, it is their job to prepare the table that holds the showbread for, for travel, okay? It is their job. So we're, we're, we're back here uh, when, they, when they just had the tabernacle, and then we know that they moved this tabernacle whenever they moved, right? Mm-hmm. So they, whenever they were getting ready to move, they had to prepare this tabern or this table to be moved. Mm-hmm. That's Aaron and his son's job. Only they are allowed to do this. And I'm going to tell you why. Because anybody else is going there. You know how Israel is. They, you know, oh, they see this stuff on the bread. Okay, throw the table, throw the, the cover on the table, snatch that joint up, put it over the shoulder and walk out. That's, that's, that's how we handle stuff. Man. No, you got to have respect to the Lord's most holy things. Yeah. He's not going to deal with that, okay? He's not going to have that. He gave them a specific instruction. Where are you at? Verse 8. Read it. And they shall spread upon them a cloth of scarlet and cover the same with the covering of badger skins Uh and shall put in the staves thereof. And put in the staves thereof. So they're being very careful how they handle this stuff, showing respect and reverence to the Most High and His holy things. Very careful. Keep going. And they shall take a cloth of blue and the cover and cover the candlestick of the light and his lamps and his tongs and his snuff dishes mm-hmm. and all the oil vessels thereof wherewith they minister unto it uh-huh. and they shall put it and all the vessels thereof within a covering of badger skins and shall put upon put it upon a bar uh-huh. and upon the golden altar they shall spread a cloth of blue and cover it with a covering of badger skins and shall put to the staves thereof. Uh-huh. And they shall take all the instruments of ministry wherewith they minister in the sanctuary and put them in a cloth of blue and cover them with a covering of badger skins and shall put them on a bar. Uh-huh. And they shall take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth thereon. Uh-huh. And they shall put upon it all the vessels thereof wherewith they minister about it, even the censers, the flesh hooks, and the shovels, and the basins, all the vessels of the altar, they shall spread upon it a covering of badger skins to put the staves of it. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the cam- as, as the camp it is, wait, I'm sorry, as the camp it is to set forward after that, the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. Hold on a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> you see what I'm telling you? The Lord is serious about this thing. Yes, sir. They don't come in there and handle nothing until Aaron and his sons have properly prepared this thing for travel. Wow. They got it all set up. Remember them stabs they put in there? Aaron they even put the stabs in those four, four uh, holders, those four rings, mm-hmm. so that when the sons of Kohath come in there, all they got to do is grab that joint and pick it up and walk out with it because it's all prepared. They ain't got to touch none of that lest they die. Hmm. That is serious. That is serious. Lest they die. Now, see, it's, we can sit here and we, we can read that, and, it, and, you know, we can say, oh, okay, they die. But when you put that... In real, think about that. You walk in here and touch something the Lord said don't do, and you, that, it's a, that's a wrap. Man. That, you see what I'm saying? He ain't playing. It is, he is serious. Yeah. He yeah. is serious. It's something, you know, it, it takes death to get Israel's attention. It takes a lot of death to get our attention. Man. Because we lose, we, we, you know, we get desensitized, and we don't, we don't see the importance to things. That's but deep. God is not playing with us. If he was going to, look, he was going to murk these cats who was most holy. They was sanctified. They went, they went through sanctification. They went through purification to be right. We just dip, got dipped in the water. You know what I'm saying? I, we got to be careful. We got to be careful. <laughs> He's going to get you. Man. Did we finish that? Middle of 15, Come, end of 15. Read that. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. Mm -hmm. It is their job, it is their burden to carry these things. If it isn't done right, let's look at an example of something not done right. Uh 2 Samuel 6. We just got baptized, huh? Man. That ain't nothing. Relative to. 2 Samuel 6. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. So I say, you know, we in this day and age, we take too many, too many liberties with the word of God. Man. 
thinking we're, you know, we're safe. We are not safe, brothers and sisters, at no time. 2 Samuel 6, verse 1, read it. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Mm -hmm. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Geba and, U and Uzzah and Ao, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. Uh -huh. And they brought it out of the house of Ad Abinadab which was at Geba, accompanying the ark of God, and Ao went before the ark. Uh -huh. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made, by fir, made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and timbers and on coronets and on cymbals. Okay, so just to bring you up to speed, Israel's just gotten this ark of the covenant back after it's been lost for some time, and they're mm -hmm. bringing this thing out of the city of David up into Jerusalem. That's the plan, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 6. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Mm -hmm. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, mm -hmm. and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Killed him, graveyard dead, <laughs> for doing it, what he perceived to be a, a good thing. He saw that. He saw the oxen stumble and the ark was about to fall, reached out his hand to stable it, and the Lord killed him, just like that. He proceeded to be a good thing, but you, that is not how you handle it. That's not how you handle the most holy thing. I, mean, I wouldn't want to see it fall on the ground, but look, no, mm, <laughs> I'll step back and just watch that joint fall. I'm sorry. <laughs> Life is too precious. Preach. But you got to be you got these things have got to be done a specific way. If it had been done the right way, this could have never happened. This could have never happened. What David then do, was doing, I thought I'd put this in here. Let me see, maybe it's a typo. No, I didn't put it in here. But uh, what they should have done, you remember how the table was moved with the staffs, right? Yeah. Okay. That was how they had this, they had the ark on a cart pulled by oxen. If they had done, if they had simply followed the Lord's instructions and put the staffs through the ark and carried it the right way, that never would have happened. This man lost his life because they weren't careful with the instructions that was given to them. We have to be very careful with the instructions in righteousness, brothers and sisters. Instructions in righteousness. If you want salvation, you got to follow these instructions in righteousness. It's very, very important. Very important. Last place, 2 Peter 1. He says, he said he made a breach in a, a breach upon us. Now I'm not I'm not exactly sure how that happens, but I, I picture the Lord just punched him through the chest, touching that, just just opened his chest up. Mm. Can you imagine that? Yeah, unfortunately. Man. Yeah. Can I play with the Lord? If you ain't right, better get right. Man. Stop Quick and fast, because we ain't promised tomorrow. Second Peter 1, verse 2. Uh, yeah. Second Peter 1, verse 2. Okay, go ahead. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Mm-hmm. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Come on. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He has given us exceeding and great precious promises. But you have to follow his instructions in order for those things to be realized. It is very important that you follow his instructions. Keep mm -hmm. going. Verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence. Giving all what? Diligence. Uh -huh. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue knowledge. And to virtue what? Knowledge. Knowledge. 
You have to add, you have to, add to virtue knowledge, being very diligent to do this. You've got to study these scriptures to show thyself approved. Show thyself approved. Be diligent about it. Add knowledge, because without the benefit of knowledge, that's how you end up mm. celebrating Christmas. That's how you end up celebrating Easter. Mm. That's how you end up fa- uh, worshiping false gods of wood and stone without the benefit of knowledge. Mm. So it would behoove you to be very diligent and gain and add, fa- add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Keep going. And to knowledge, temperance. Uh-huh. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. Yes, sir. Come on. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Uh huh. And to brotherly kindness, charity. That's right. Because these things, because brotherly charity, brotherly kindness, charity to your brother, this is among the most important things, brothers and sisters. Preach. Helping your fellow man to get where you were trying to get to. Preach. Most important. Keep going. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-huh, keep going. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off Mm -hmm. and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's right, because we, when, you are, when, you are, when you lack knowledge, when you lack these things, you're blind. You can't see it far off. When you don't study this book, you don't know what the showbread represents. Huh. You don't know not to touch the ark when it stumbles. You don't know not to carry it that way. Hmm. You're blinded, so you've got to study to show yourself approved. It means, your, it means life and death. Yeah. It is that serious. It is that serious. Keep going. Verse 10. Mm-hmm. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You want to be sure you get salvation? Be diligent in your study and your research and following your instructions in righteousness. Be diligent about it. Finish that. For if you do these things, Uh ye shall never fail. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. Okay, before we have the, um, before we have the regular announcements, mm-hmm. um, there was a note in the, um, in the offering box, I'm told. I'm going to read the prayer note box. in the prayer box. I'm sorry, prayer box, in the prayer box. There was a note left in the prayer box. It says, the note says, pray for me because I'm losing the battle and I'm tired of fighting. And there's no, we don't know who this is. There's no, no name given here. So what I would say is that if hopefully this person is listening, let's all, ter- let's all turn to James 1 real quick. Let's turn to James 1 real quick. Hopefully this will help this person out. James 1 and 1, go ahead. James, a servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting, mm-hmm. my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Now, now that seems like a hard thing, right? He says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Everything you're going through is common to man. You're not alone. Whoever it is, whoever it is that is, is going through this time, you are not alone. If you are a member of this congregation, reach out to somebody in here. We've got a loving congregation here. Any one of us should be willing at all times to do whatever we can to help you get over that hump. Preach. Count it joy when all the, when, whenever you fall into these diverse con, uh, temptations. Keep going. Three, knowing this. Knowing what? Knowing this, mm-hmm. that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of your faith works patience. You you're go through these things to teach you something because you're trying to build. The Lord is shaping you into something better. Yep. He's teaching you to be something better. But you have to go through some stuff in order to learn how to be better. You don't just go, you don't just go today and become a doctor. You got to go through some years of training. It don't come overnight. You can't be God overnight. You got to go through some trials and tribulations to learn how to be God. Yes, sir. It's the the prize to him that, that overcomes. Keep going. Four. But let patience 
have her perfect work. Mm -hmm. Be patient. Let her have her perfect work. When I was uh, playing basketball, they all said, uh, uh, per, uh, perfect practice. How's it go? Perfect, perfect. perfect practice. Perfect. Per, there you go. Practice makes perfect. You got to practice these, try, getting, getting better at resisting temptations, getting better at overcoming these tribulations so that you can become perfect. Yes. You got to practice at it. You got to have, you got to go through an experience first before you can know what it's even about, yeah. right? Yeah. I can't tell you how it was to run the race if I never ran it. You got to go through these things. Practice makes perfect. Verse five. That you may be perfect mm -hmm. and entire, wanting nothing. Mm -hmm. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally. That's right. When you're going through this stuff, ask God. He will give you the wisdom to get over whatever it is in your life, and he gives it away liberally. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you have to, you have to keep on. You, cannot, you, can't, you can't let yourself lose the battle. It's the, the race is won by him that endures. Yes, you have to continue to, to, to battle through this, whatever you're going through. Keep going. And upbraideth not, mm -hmm. and up it shall be given him. He says, upbraideth not. Don't fail. Don't give up. Even though it's hard, don't give up. Keep going. Six, but let him ask in faith, mm -hmm. nothing wavering. That's key. Know when you ask the Lord, he is going to grant your, your prayer. Be confident in that. Be confident in that. He don't want wishy-washy people. Preach. He done told us in Revelation, I would rather, he, he, I would, uh, you got to be hot. You got to be hot for this thing. Right. Don't waver. Keep going. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Driven like they just, just, just tossed any which way. Then the, uh, Paul said, we got to be, we, we got to be uh, uh, as men, not as children, carried away with every wind, wind of doctrine. doctrine. We got, to be, we got to be committed in this thing. If you are committed to serving the Lord, stay strong. Keep on fighting. He'll get you through this thing. Keep going. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord's. That's right. You will not receive anything from the Lord if you're not committed to serving him. Keep going. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He can't use you. He can't use you. Verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in he that is exalted. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Skip down to verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For what? For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Okay, and, I'm, and that's where we're going to stop. Keep on keeping up the good fight. Don't give in because the Lord will bless you. To, he, the blessing comes to he that endured. You will get that crown of life if you just endure. Yeah. You never know. It's just maybe one more day going through what you're going through, yes. and then many blessings may come flooding in. Really? You just never know. It makes no sense to give up. No. I mean, what's, you, you're serving the Lord. If you're serving the Lord now, what's the alternative? You're going to turn to the world? You know, yeah. that's no good. That you, came, you came to this thing from, the, from there. So that already didn't work out for you. So keep up your strength. And with that, we'll, we'll end that. Go ahead and uh, read your instruction. Announcement. Good stuff, brother. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increased your knowledge of the Holy Bible. CDs and DVDs of the Sabbath lessons are available. Please place your order and donation in an offering envelope, and it will be filled on the next Sabbath. The children's class, ages 5 through 12, starts at the same time as the adult Sabbath lesson in the assigned location. Bring, bring your child that their knowledge may be increased. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Adult question and answer is from 4.30 to 6.30 after the Sabbath lesson. We have question and answer every Wednesday at 5 o'clock p.m. via telephone conference line. The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson, or see the live stream of question and answer at www.kingdomcome7.com. If you are interested in being baptized, please place your name on the list at the literature table. Remember to follow the dress code when attending our services. Men should remove all hats and all head coverings during service times. Women should wear a head covering, such as a hat or scarf, during the service. Women should not wear tight-fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest, according to the Bible. If your child becomes restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she has settled 
Your tithes and offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in an offering envelope and deposit an offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you on the next Sabbath. Peace. Peace. And I got the homeless outreach. Uh, the January. January 9th. January 